Hello, uh, my name is John Lay. Um, I'm a comic book enthusiast, I guess would be the best way to describe it. Have been uh, into the hobby since about 1973. And um, what I wanted to talk about today is the first black American comic book artist, Matt Baker. Uh, probably most of anybody out there who's hearing this isn't, uh, isn't familiar with him. He's not a well-known name. Unfortunately, he should be, but unfortunately he is not. Um, he had quite, he did, uh, however, do something that not a lot of people don't know about. How many of you heard the term graphic novel? These are these comics that are basically long form comics. They're like books, you know, beginning, a middle, and an end, that sort of thing. And they're just basically like a novel with pictures and words. Well, generally it's acknowledged that they were invented in the late 70s by um, either Will Eisner, who was a very famous comic creator who created a character called The Spirit, or Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did one of the first ones, which was The Silver Surfer. But actually, a full 30-some years before that, this book came out. And it is a graphic novel in every sense of the word. It is words and pictures throughout. Beginning, middle, ending. It's basically a kind of crime story. You know, film noir type of thing. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with that, you know. Femme fatales and all that. But it's a very good book. And I'd like to be the first... <laughs> not the first to give Matt Baker credit for this accomplishment that he was involved in, but to actually be one of the, probably one of the first to actually go on record and say that this was pretty much the first graphic novel. So who was Matt Baker? Well, he was born in 1921 in North Carolina. And he moved, his family moved to Pittsburgh after that, New York City. So he was lucky in that he didn't deal with a lot of the prejudice in the South, you know, because he wasn't in the worst part of the South to have dealt with that. Um, he was for he well, he was up for Army ser service in the 40s, like most young men his age, but he didn't go because he had heart issues. You know, there was some kind of problem with his heart that had come from when he was a kid. So. He did uh, serve the war effort some, though, in that he created, he did do one of these characters that they do during the World War II. Um, there was a, uh, or there was a, there was another comic book artist or a comic strip artist named Milk Caniff. He did a book called Mail Call, which was all military stuff. You know, basically these books were pretty girls and military stuff mixed together. So his contribution was Canteen Kate. This character right here um, didn't last a long time. Just during the war years, appeared in a few books. In fact, this is pretty much the entire collection of what she appeared in. <laughs> this is pretty much the whole thing. But it was an interesting character, and it was reflective of the times. You know, in the 1940s, and it also highlighted what Matt Baker's true gift was as an artist, which was that he did very, very beautiful women on on paper. He could draw great looking girls. And that is pretty much what he's known for, is good girl art, they call it. Um, it's kind of cheesecake. But his stuff had a quality to it, I think, that was a little better than the average one out there. You know, so he got, he got a lot more work than the average guys did back then. Now, I'd like to tell you a lot about his life, but a lot is not known about it. <laughs> he was reputed to be a ladies' man but nobody never got married, and he kept his private life to himself. What he did do is he left behind a lot of work. The most famous thing he did, probably this is what he's best known for. This was a comic, came out in the 40s, called The Phantom Lady. Didn't come out for Marvel or DC or any of the big publishers. Back then they had dozens of them. Um, Marvel and DC are, are kind of the big two to this day that are still in existence, they still are around. DC bought out a lot of the publishers, in fact. They bought out a lot of the old ones. 
Um, one of them was the company that did Phantom Lady, which was Fox Publications. And um, they bought them out years ago and put her character into their continuity, you know, give her a backstory on their books, and, and she's been used occasionally. But it's still not a real famous, well-known character, you know, these comics from the 40s are basically it. But they were known, like I said, for their good artwork. Um, and, the, and that's what they're basically like for to this day. Now, the big company that employed a lot of these artists was this place here, Fiction House. Fox was one, Fiction House, Avon Publishing, they had a bunch of them. But Fiction House specialized in the kind of books that Matt Baker did. Their, uh, their claim to fame was uh, science fiction, uh, jungle girls like Sheena, you know, Queen of the Jungle was theirs, and female superhero heroines and that kind of thing. They, they basically specialized in that. And um, they provided a lot of work for the man. And he worked for them off and on pretty much throughout his career. Uh, because of the nature of the kind of work he did, and the kind of art he did, he got lucky during the 50s, actually. During the 1950s, there was a huge censorship movement against comics because of a doctor named Frederick Wortham. He wrote a book called Seduction of the Innocent. And basically what this book postulated was the idea that juvenile delinquency was largely caused by movies and comic books and stuff like that, but comic books were the big perpetrator. Uh, this book uh, came out with ideas like Batman and Robin was a closeted homosexual relationship, you know, the lesbian overtones of Wonder Woman. The superhero comics got hit pretty hard, but he really hit the comics that were popular at the time, which was horror. Horror and gangster type stuff was really big at the time. He hit them the hardest. They went out of business by the droves because of him. But he got lucky in the fact that, uh, Baker got lucky because he was working on the kind of books that they didn't go after that much. You know, it got mentioned a couple of times, but he didn't really go after them full hog. He was, more, he was too busy going after the horror stuff. He didn't like the crime comics. That's what he felt the kids got really wound up on. But anyhow, he weathered that pretty good. A lot of artists didn't. A lot of artists, by the time that was over with, it, it was about a year, 1954 to 55, and in that year, dozens of artists left the field. They left the field because it was shameful to be considered a comic book artist. They felt that it, um, you know, some felt it was not a good way to make a living. They were ashamed. They were just very upset with it. Um, some just couldn't get work. You know, there's a story that Stan Lee over at uh, what was then Marvel was called Timely Comics. In fact, at this point, it, was, it actually went through a couple names. It was um, Atlas at this point, and he was literally letting people go. You know, giving them their pink slips. He was the only guy left in the building, pretty much. And his, and his boss was going off to Florida for a vacation. Nice story there. But um, he would try to slip work to the people. You know, they would do that, try and slip them some work here and there wherever they could. But um, it, was a, it, was, it was not a good time for the medium, and it almost pretty much died. And probably would have if it hadn't been for Stan Lee and Marvel about 10 years after that. That kind of revolutionized everything and changed it. But that's another story. By that time, unfortunately, uh, all of this was in the past. Now, he did do some other books. One other character he did that was noteworthy, but this is actually kind of fun. Sky Gal, or also known as Sky Girl, which is basically a waitress who's also a pilot and gets into outlandish adventures, basically climbing onto planes, fighting Nazis, Jap Japanese guys, whatever they threw at her for the World War II era. Ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> as you can see, she's... Basically climbing on planes in high heels. It's pretty stupid. But the art's nice and it's fun. It's cute. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not going to set the world on fire, but it's fun stuff. I liked it. But um, by the way, I should note that the graphic novel that he did the artwork on was written by an, another fellow 
who was also a comic book veteran. His name was, um, and, I, and I can't believe I'm going to blank on it right now. <laughs> That's a good one. I hate when that happens. Uh, actually, I, um, creator of the Doom Patrol, for God's sake. Anyhow, he um, wrote it. But he actually, you know, they worked together on the, they worked together on the plot, but he did the actual writing. But um, you know, some interesting stuff about him. This is what he looked like, Matt Baker. So I can see where the ladies' man story probably came from. You can kind of see that. If you like, you know, I'll give you an example of some like of the artwork. A little, oh, a little bit, yeah, I think yeah. so too. Yeah, he did all of these. And he was the first black. He was the first African American to actually achieve success in the American comic industry. There had never been another at that time. Yeah, it is amazing stuff, some of it. You can't tell the difference, can you? No. No. Just, right. He just did great work. There's Canteen Kate. They used her for a lot of public service announcements and stuff. You know, they loved to do that during World War II because it was a way of making it personable. Well, the men liked it. No, well, the men loved it, yeah. You know, a pretty face never scared people away. Right. That was always the attitude back then, and I think it probably still holds true. I don't think it's changed all that much. Um, a little more to be say about Fiction House. Fiction House basically, as a company, grew out of the pulps. And the pulps were what recently preceded comics. Before comics, there were the pulps. Uh, the pulps were basically very cheap magazines, 10 cents a piece, um, printed on very cheap paper, pulp stock, which is where the name pulps comes from, of course. And uh, probably the most noteworthy ones you might have heard of are like The Shadow was a big pulp, and also Doc Savage, The Spider, these were superheroes before there were superheroes, basically. You know, um, in fact, it is said that, that, that uh, Superman is actually named after Doc Savage. His first name, Clark, is the same as Doc Savage's first name, which is Clark Savage. So that was kind of a tribute by the guys who created Superman to the pulps. Um, of course, the uh, Shadow was the precursor of Batman, you know, dark. Your dark hero that's more mysterious, a little more edgy, you know, killed people, <laughs> killed the bad guys, whereas Doc Savage didn't kill them. Like Superman, he was more of a Boy Scout. He would, uh, actually, he did something almost as controversial. He would actually operate on their brains, a form of acupuncture, and actually take the evil out of them, basically, you know, which was kind of controversial, actually, because it's a horrible thought, really. It's kind of against the precepts of what we consider justice and all that in this country. So it's interesting that people bought into that. But those are the pulps. They were just stories. They're like tall tales. And nobody's really looking to get too political with it. But we all know how that goes, you know. It gets too political. It gets, takes all the fun out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> but um, he did have an effect on things, little Baker did. Um, in the fact that uh, his stuff was so popular that he was always working. He never had a period in his entire comic book career that he was down for any length of time. They always had a need for what he had, what he was doing. So they were always selling it. Now there was other artists who did the same thing a lot. Um, probably the most noteworthy one is uh, Jack Cole, the creator of Plastic Man. Uh, when he, when the comics got rough in the 50s and he lost, he got lost a lot of work. He went over to Playboy and illustrated the you know, little joke ad, you know, little gags with girls on them, you know, cute girls and gags and stuff, and did pretty good for himself. But uh, he never had to get to that point. Baker always had work because those fiction house people were always trying to make a buck on some book, you know. And that was what it was back then. It was basically an industry of how many books can we put out, how, how many will keep the presses running. That was a big thing back then, keeping the presses running. They had presses, and they cost a lot of money to run them. And the only way they paid off was that they kept them running constantly. 
So their attitude was as much as you can get out there, get it out there and sell it. And at one time, there was probably 30, 40 companies proving comics. And at one time in the 40s, at the height of it, there was five or six, 700 comics a month. These comics sold in numbers that by today's standards, the biggest comic selling today is like a tenth, maybe of what they sold. I mean, that's how big it was at one point. Uh, right around 1952, 50 through about 52, that hit a real high. And, and, and that was, a, that was contrib a contrib contribution to that was the uh, popularity of the horror comics, which were brought in by a guy named William Gaines. Or, uh, and he basically had the idea, he had a little company that he inherited from his dad, actually. His dad was uh, a publisher, he was one of the early publishers of comics. And he had a little company called Educate, educating or comics or educational comics, EC. Well, he got a hold of it. He didn't want it. It got left to him when his dad passed away. So he said, well, I'll sell it to somebody, but I'll go in and see what it's like. He went in and he looked around and he saw the possibilities and potential in it. That there could be something to be got out of it. That there's possibilities to make some money here and actually do something good. And he liked horror stories, and he liked science fiction, and that kind of thing. So what he did was he basically got the best artists he could hire. He got hired all the big names he could get, really good artists. Gave them really good salaries, paid top dollar, and turned out great books. And they were really nice quality books. Unfortunately, they also were a little over the top on the gore with the horror stories. Um, they were the first company to do anti-war comics. And these guys were doing anti-war in 1951, too, when it was not popular to do that. Um, they all did a lot of science fiction, but they never sold as well. They're beautiful books. I mean, they're gorgeous to look at, but they just, science fiction just is always, it never sells quite as well. It's just the way it is. It was that way then, it is that way. It's probably gotten better now. You know, with guys like George R.R. R. Martin and guys like that out there doing things like Great Game of Thrones, you know, science fiction has gone way up the ladder over the years. But back then it was still pretty much a struggling form. Hello. Hi. Welcome. I would see right there if you will. Thank you. So anyhow, that was the climate they were working in then. You know, and uh, it was a huge industry and when it, when it went downhill, it went downhill fast. They, they started to put in a thing called the Comics Code. And basically it made everything weak. You, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you couldn't have any kind of gore. Uh, you, were, you couldn't have any kind, of, uh, any kind of questioning of authority. Like you couldn't have, like for instance, the old comics they could have a judge who was a crooked, right? And the new version, nope. No crooked judges, no crooked cops. All cops must be treated with respect. All law officers, all officials must be treated with utmost respect. And it made for some pretty clean comics. It also made for some very boring comics, but that's another story. They were, they were incredibly dull. They were written toward kids. And this was a medium that was actually adults were reading them as much as kids at the height of it. Now there wasn't anything for the adults to read and the kids were, you know, it was getting the kids, it was getting, it was getting under them pretty quick too. You know, about age 10, they'd give up. You know, they were looking for something else. But luckily, as I said before that, Marvel came along after that and they kind of changed the course of it. But this was back before that. And one thing they did try, and a few things did get experimented with, you know, like luckily back in the 40s, people were willing to try something new. After Matt Baker made the breakthrough there, they did try publishing a comic that was done completely by African Americans, written by them, drawn by them, published by them. I'd like to say it had a long and successful life. I can't say that because it didn't. It lasts about two issues. But it is a piece of history nonetheless. It's something unique that it was the shape of things to come because if you hadn't had this and you hadn't had Matt Baker's art, maybe we would never have had Black Panther or uh, Black Lightning, for instance. There's another one, Luke Cage all the characters that have come along, and other people that have worked in the industry that are, you know, there's an artist named Bill Graham that I can think of. 
uh, Dwayne, Dwayne Turner, I think his name was Dwayne Turner. He had just passed away a couple of years ago, but he did a lot of work for Marvel, DC. You know, all people that are African Americans that got opportunities over the years, you know. But of course, that was because the also that was partly because Stan Lee, when he was to, when he ran Marvel, liked to put people in positions that were whatever. He liked talent. He said, "If you have the talent, let's do it." And he, and he also felt that there should be black superheroes. That's why they, him and Jack Kirby came up with Black Panther. Because they felt there should be black superheroes. There should be something for kids to look up to. And you know, I, and I'll tell you a personal story. I saw, I went to the movie when it came out. Yeah, and I loved, one of the things I loved in that movie, and I'll never forget it as long as I live, was seeing all the black men with sons. All the black guys there that had sons. Their sons with them. You know? It is good, and it is the culture. It's it's a, it's a good movie for that. It also works better. It also works better because a lot of people say that the Black Panther kind of takes off on the Phantom, the old Lee Falk thing. But really, he's taking off on the old stories of African American culture. Black Panther's just kind of taking it back. It's just taking it back from a different angle. But it's that. But a lot of people compare them because it has that same idea of the hero who goes from generation to generation and is passed down. And the father becomes it and the son becomes and all that. But it's still powerful stuff and it's good. I mean, Lion King owes a debt to that kind of culture, cultural storytelling. And when you come down to it, Lion King's basically the same story. It's just without the costumes and the, well, and the vibranium, of course. I love the vibranium. I just love that. I just think that's awesome. Vibranium, the stuff they mine that makes the country so rich, because they were able to do so many things with that stuff scientifically. Yeah, the the stuff that the, the stuff they built the cap shield out of, all of that. I wish that stuff were real. <laughs> think of the uses you could put that to. It'd be awesome. I mean, I just think I can just think a NASA alone would go nuts. You know, they'd have uh, ships that could never fall fall apart. You know, basically, it would be totally absorb vibration. But I digress. What he did was a lot of work in uh, a kind of comic book noir. Like I said, it was like film noir. You can see this one here. <laughs> Very clearly noir style. If there ever was. It looks like it could have come off an old Bogart movie. She does, doesn't she? I, I think so too, oddly enough. Yeah, I do believe there's a little Brenda star there. Actually, I heard a story once. There was an artist named Joe Kubert who worked for DC, and his wife was this beautiful redhead. And I say that all, half the artists that worked in the company and worked in other companies, they're in love with his wife. He just loved to draw pictures of her, and they say that's why so many people in the 40s look like that. They were all doing tributes halfway to her or Rita Hayworth, one or the other. As you can see, his specialty was drawing really pretty girls. And he was gifted <laughs> to say the least a little bit there for you but unfortunately his career wasn't a long one the heart trouble that kept him out of the war was also what finally got him in uh, the late 50s height of his career still you know working going strong he uh, had a heart attack and passed away and Leaving us with the question, what might he have done if he'd lived, you know? I mean, that's always that question we have when they go, Leon, you know, we always wonder what they would have done. We speculate, you know? Like, would James Dean have become an even better actor than he was? Or, you know, if Sharon Tate hadn't been killed by Manson, would she have been an Academy Award winner, you know, someday? Who knows? We'll never know, unfortunately. We know the people that involved had potential. We saw that. There's enough to... But that's the tragedy of it, is that you lose those people early. And such it is with Matt Baker. He, uh, is no longer, he was no longer with us by the time comics really got rolling in the Silver Age. It was right after he passed away that DC brought out uh, 1959. And uh, that was about a year before, well, it was actually a year or two after DC started bringing back superheroes. That was the first step in the Silver Age, as they call it. They brought back the Flash in a new version. 
you know, gave him a better costume, new identity, a little nicer take on the material. The original Flash looked like Mercury. You know, he had the helmet and had the red shirt and the blue pants. He looked kind of plain. Um, I'm a big fan of the original Green Lantern, actually, the one from the 40s, because he had a really interesting costume because it was kind of odd color scheme. But the, yeah, yeah, but the new one, they brought in, you know, the uh, green costume with the white, and he had the power ring that was powered by something from outer space. The original, I think, was a mystic lantern or something, more like Aladdin's lamp. Then went more science fiction-y. And that started a whole other revolution that really didn't, almost didn't get off the ground itself because they were still working from those uh, really toned down scripts, you know, that the comics code would let them. But then you got Stan Lee and Marvel, and he came up with that wonderful innovation that he had, which was make them human. Make the characters human, and it snuck up on people. It grabbed people. The comics code didn't know what to do with it. They couldn't really say no. I mean, he wasn't doing anything out of the way, though he was able over a period of time to kind of break the code a little at a time. You know, little things got left behind, like he was able to show a bad cop once in a while or a bad person that was in authority. But he did that over a period of time. And uh, unfortunately, Matt Baker wasn't there for any of that, and I wish he had been because sometimes, because I wonder what he would have done. I, I, think he would've, I think he would have gotten into the other kinds of comics eventually because that would have become the whole market. And I think he could have made the transition, personal opinion. I think he would have done it. Like, like I said, we can never know, but I, I think he had the talent to do it. And he had worked with superheroes. He did do, after all, the Phantom, the Phantom Lady here, which was an old 40s style, but if you've done that, you know, you can kind of adapt. I know that Stan Lee would have looked him up because he looked for talent. That was his thing, man. He was always, any artist he could get in that building, he could get talented artists he could get in there, he would get them. And half of them didn't believe there would be even be a medium for him to work in. One of his best artists was a guy named John Romita, and he says to this day back then, when he had cooked excitement off him, he says, oh, I'll be working for a couple of months. This thing's all going to fall apart within a couple of months, so I ain't worried about it. This guy ended up working at Marvel for 40 some years. He became the art director. He had more to do with the company probably than anybody but Stan Lee. And... Um, Basically, uh, he, he didn't realize how big it was going to be. He had no idea. Uh, they really thought that the whole thing that came out of that 50 censorship was just going to fall apart. But um, obviously, fate had other things in store. And uh, lucky me, I'm glad they did because I love this medium. I consider it an art form. I have, um, in fact, that's why I do this. I consider it an art form and I like to kind of let people see that side of it, that there is something special to it. And it is, it is a unique way of telling a story, you know. One of the best quotes I ever heard was from Will Eisner, who created The Spirit, uh, which was a huge character in uh, comic book history in the 40s. Uh, it was the first weekly comic strip, actually. It was not a strip, it was an, actually a comic book. It was seven pages long and appeared in the paper every Sunday. Beautiful stuff. And um, he once said, Comics are words and pictures. There's no limit to how good those words and pictures can be. And interestingly, so many have proven that since. You look at today and what you have, graphic novels, which have proven that you can do complex storylines, uh, beautiful work of, works of art. Uh, Maus by Art Spiegelman, which is a two-part graphic novel about, basically about the concentration camps and uh, Nazis. And it casts the Nazis are cats and the Jews are mice. But it's very powerful. It's still as powerful as any Holocaust book you'll ever read. Yeah, it is. Almost like that, except very serious. It took a little different turn. Uh, they did Watchmen, which kind of changed the superhero way to look at superheroes. You know, here was an idea that what, are, what would superheroes really be like if they were real? You know, how might they differ from what we know them to be? Would they be noble or would they be flawed? And of course, in the Watchmen, they're flawed. Well, you keep saying that. Have you ever seen the mutants? Yes. Mutants are great. Well, they're, right there. they're flawed, but they're great. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, well, that was the, actually, 
that was one of the that was one of the coolest things they ever did was um, the X Men. The whole X Men thing was founded on the idea of the of basically the civil rights movement. It was a reflection of it, and uh, Professor Charles Xavier was meant to be a reflection of um, of Martin of Martin Luther King, and Magneto is basically Malcolm X. You know, the one who says we have to fight for the right, we have to conquer them to prove that we are worthy of yeah it is and it, that's what he used it as it was a anti-mutant the anti-mutant prejudice is basically any prejudice you can put on it anti-black anti-white anti-gay McKellen 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 you McKellen who plays Magneto in the movies he was attracted to it because of that because he felt at least he were part of, he was part of a group that had been persecuted to some degree and they had been let's face it Hitler went after them too he didn't play no favorites that's for sure but uh, basically you know that's the complex world that they've become you know comics are complex as anything you know you've got a comic book movie up for an Oscar now um, Black Panther's up for best picture and I, I predicted, I actually predicted it was going to happen. I could see that one coming. I'll tell you, the only other time they ever came close was that Dark Knight movie, the one with Heath Ledger. That came close. I could tell that they wanted to. But they didn't quite do it. They, they went for him instead as an actor. Because I, I remember seeing the Dark Knight and thinking, this is basically a Martin Scorsese movie with superheroes. That's what it is. It's basically good fellows with costumes. <laughs> you know, it's that same language. It's that same beats. It's all got all the same kind of beats to it. It's just you got a guy in a costume and a guy who's basically looks like a killer clown. <laughs> it's it's the same basic. It's the basic idea. It's there. But it, that that shows how comics have grown. That you can do that now. I mean, there was a time when they. Let's face it, back in 1966 when they did Adam West Batman, nobody was thinking of that. <laughs> but that's a valid version too. You know, I've always said there's people who look down on that version. I say, hey, it's perfectly valid. It's as good as anything else that's out there. It's just another interpretation. Absolutely. Oh, Captain, Captain, what was that? Captain Underoos or Captain Underwear? Or there was one, uh, the, fl the, the Tick. The Tick, that was meant to be a spoof of comic book superheroes, you know, very square jawed, you know, like Dudley Do Right, you know, very, very uh, silly. <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing is, if you take it seriously, if you respect it, it can work, you know? I mean, you look at the Superman movies, they were kind of interesting. The ones with Christopher Reeve, they sort of walked that thin line between Batman in 1966 and being kind of dead serious. They didn't go for quite the camp feel of the, of the, of the TV series, but they also made it a little more down to earth. They made Superman a little more real. Lex Luthor was a little campy and some of the characters around him, but, but they got a good laugh out of it, actually. It made for some fun stuff, you know? In this case, I refer to uh, Gene Hackman, the Oscar-winning actor who played Lex Luthor. Oh, okay. He does have that distinction. I think he's the only one who's done that. Um, no, though, Kevin Spacey did, too, come to think of it, although I didn't like that movie much. I was not a fan of Superman Returns. I just, uh, it was a little weak. That was, a, the only scene in it I really remember is when he saves the, sh the space shuttle and lands it on the ball field. It was awesome. Yeah, that's a Superman moment. But uh, it just didn't have a good plot. I, I, I admit it, I'm, I'm kind of prejudiced to like Christopher Reeve's version. I just think he did it great. He did for Superman what uh, Chris Evans does for Captain America. I just, I don't think he really did it. The one in the 50s was George Reeves. No, no, no relation at all, but he had an interesting life. Yeah, because he was, I like him. He was strong, you know, he was all You know, they always kept him real proper. Mm-hmm. You ever notice the flaw he had, though? He, he never overcame it. It's a real simple thing that basically nobody ever notices unless you point it out to him. Whenever the bad guys would fire guns at him, they would bounce the bullets and bounce off, of course, right? He'd always just stand there and the bullets bounce off. Bump, 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 bump. 
And when they, what their next move would always be, inevitably, nine times out of ten, they'd throw the gun at him. Every single time, he never could control the flinch. <laughs> he would flinch a little. He got to the point where he got good enough to kind of fool you on it, but he always is there, that little flinch, like he didn't want to get hit. <laughs> and he, of course, naturally. Then years later, I saw a movie called Doc Savage that was based on the Pulps, and it had Ron Eli in it, and they had a scene where a guy throws a whole rifle at him and an elephant gun. And he pulled it off great. He just, boom, right off his chest. Just, <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> it was perfect. But he never, ever got over that. He, he got to the point where he could fool it pretty good. He could call, control the flinch. Well, they could have did it with the camera. If it's closed. Oh, yeah, or they, did, or they got to the point where they started cutting the film a little different, I think, was why it really happened. But he did the flying scenes great. I remember they had to do those a specific way. They showed that in a movie Ben Affleck made where he played... Reeves, they had him laying on this thing, and they would film it in front of us, blow it up for those screens, you know, for rear projection, so it looks really cool. Which actually was an improvement over the very first Superman. The first one was in a, uh, I believe it was a serial. You know, they used to run in movies, they used to run serials in the movies with your feature films back in the 40s, and they had one of Superman, and they animated his flying. So it was a regular guy all through the movie, but whenever he flew, he would turn into this little animated guy. <laughs> and then he'd flip back. Yeah, it was really kind of, it didn't really work too well. Uh, I mean, not, not by today's standards, certainly not by then, but not today. We, we, we look at that today, we just laugh our butts right. off. I mean, look what they could do now, you know. Oh I mean, well, they've gone far beyond even what they could do when Superman was made with Christopher Reeve. I mean, you look at you look at where CGI's gone. You know, um, stuff like look. I, I tell you what, you want to see how CGI's developed? Look at the Hulk. The very first Hulk movie, he looks like Uncle Shrek. Looks terrible. And the second one, he don't look right either. But each Avengers movie is a little better. First Avengers, they got him looking pretty good, and, but. That was that. That really showed up in Age of Ultron. I remember when they showed that scene where they showed his. Her putting her hand on him, you know, where she's calming him down, you can see the hairs. You can see the hairs and stuff, the expression on his face. Yeah, they've gotten a lot better at that. And that's going to get better ever, probably as time goes on. They're just getting better at programming the computers and they can do more. Well, you don't want to lose that human touch, you know. Right. Years ago, there was a show called Babylon 5 ran on TV for a while. And I remember they were noted for the first show that did their special effects, their ships, all in CGI. And I remember watching it and thinking, it has no depth to it. What's the acronym? CGI is completely computer generated. Oh. That means there was nothing there. You're basically looking at a computer generated model. You're not looking at an actual ship. So the C is completely generated what? I yeah, it's completely generated by the computer. Uh, computer generated image. So your eye can't really be completely fooled sometimes. You can be fooled to a degree. And they're getting better at it too. But back then, even, we're looking at it, it has no depth to it. Star Trek and all those shows, they always had those models, but, but the ships had depth to them because they were models. They actually had been constructed. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so you have no worries. I um I like Star Wars too, but it's a different kind of like. Star Trek's more of a lifelong right. like. Star Trek, I tell them I'm a Trekkie when they be saying, "Oh, you know, I only know R2D2, C3PO, Chewbacca, and Yoda." You know, yeah, I, you know, you know the basics. Or, you know, right. you know what you need Princess to know. Leia and, uh, the other guy. You know all of them. You know the basic. Right. But you know those basic folks that you, you need know the to basics. know. When they go all out, and you know, um, the, the later ones, I'm, I'm old school. I'm Captain Kirk. You know, I'm Captain yeah, Kirk and. That's and, and probably of the of the later ones, probably Cisco's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. I like Cisco okay. a lot. Yes. I like him because he was such a nice. I like him because he's such a good dad. But Scott Bakula, I just can't get with Scott Bakula there because I, I watched him in that other thing. The, I don't know why it didn't work for me either. Quantum Leap. Yeah, I love that show. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But when he went to Star Trek, I was mm. just. I'm with you. Yeah. Unfortunately, it happens that way sometimes. You know, they don't all have that same gift. You know. 
I was like, I like Picard fine. I just, he's, he's just, he had his own unique style, you know, Janeway, oh, yeah. all that different thing. The Borgs and how to you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely, you know. But that's, that's the kind of stuff you build a universe on, you know. Again, like, kind of like Gene Roddenberry did something that um, a lot of them do, which is what Stan Lee did, is he created a universe. Create the whole universe of characters, you know. You got a lot of help doing it, of course. You got your special effects, your artists, and whatever have you. But you're really creating, you're in the business of universe building. You're building a whole franchise, and the whole franchise is based on that universe. And look at the appeal that Star Trek has had. 50 plus years, and people still like it. There's still new ones being produced. There's, there's, there, I've been to a Star Trek convention one time. I've, I've gone to every single comic convention in the last 30 years, pretty much. I went to one Star Trek convention and was cured of going, not because of the stuff. It's because it was so crowded and the venue was so small. You basically looked at things this way. You went with the crowd. If the crowd moved, you moved. If the crowd did not move, you did not move. You stayed in one place. And I, and I did get to meet Marina Sirtis. I think she did a thing there. You know, Troy. And I think Worf was the other special guest that I got to meet them, which was kind of cool. Boy, that place was crowded. I remember coming out of there. I have claustrophobia, unfortunately. And it extends to crowds. If I get in too big a crowd, and actually, one of the things I do with the comic conventions is I go to those specifically because I'm fighting my claustrophobia. I figured I love comics enough to deal with it. But um, last year, I got caught pretty good at Comic Con. I got stuck between a couple of tables. This guy had these nice graphic novels on sale, and I'm trying to get in there and see them. And everybody's going out this way. He left no room for people to move. So basically, once you got in between those two tables, you were stuck there until somebody opened up, opened it up out here. Oh, I tell you, I was like, mm. my son was there with me. Luckily, he came by. He said, "You okay?" Mm. Not really, but I'll be okay. But um, he says he he says he admires the fact that I will fight my bad problems with that because I care about comics that much. But it's a good place, and it's so neat to meet the people that make them. It's really fascinating. I mean, you really, they're, they're just people like you and I, but what imaginations, you know, what gifts and imaginations it takes to do it. You know, and the artists, to watch them actually do a paint, they actually do drawings right there. I mean, there's a place in the convention called Artist Alley. And all Artist Alley is, is people doing sketches. They're professional or semi-professional comic book guys, and they're out there just doing sketches. And, and you, you wonder where it comes from. How did they come up with it? I mean, they can draw anything, you know? And it's just, it's astounding. I, I've never seen anything like it. And it's one of the reasons I guess I love it so much. When you've been at, when you've seen every stage of it like that, it, is, it does open up. Oh, it opens it up for you. You meet a few actors there, which is kind of interesting. And, Celebrities, I've met my share. <laughs> met Mickey Dolan's. That was kind of cool. Have you ever seen uh, Penny and Barbara? Any work with Penny and Barbara? I haven't, but I know somebody who has. I know a couple people who have. You know what my mother-in-law loved? She loved Thomas Kincaid, the, the uh, Master of Light. She loved Kincaid. Every year we would buy her one of those little Christmas things that he made. But um. Oh yeah, he's interesting. You know, a lot of good people. That was mine. I did that one at the bottom. Of course, in my house, it's in my house, it's all comic book art all over the place. You know, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, John Romita. I got a huge spider bed in my living room. That's on my main wall. I was fortunate enough to have gotten to meet Stan Lee before he passed away. That was luck. Yeah, my mother, my issue, my, my my wife made sure I did that. Right. Yeah, because he was coming to this one convention about 2011, and my wife said, there's no way you're going to miss out on meeting him. Right. So she paid the 200 bucks for me to have the VIP ticket. Wow. And the weird thing is, my mother-in-law said if she didn't have the money, I would have done it. Because <laughs> they knew how much he meant to me. And he really was, I can honestly say to you, they say that, they, there's an old saying, don't meet your idols because you, you'll be disappointed. In his case, I can't say that. He was as nice as can be. 
just this kind hearted. He was he was he was polite to my wife. He said hi to my wife and she didn't pay to be there. You know, I thought that's nice. You know, I got a picture of him up in my uh, living room where I got taken with taken with him that day. It was my big thrill day of, of the year, probably of the next ten years, probably. <laughs> it's nice to have anyway. And he signed my Silver Surfer book. I have a big hardcover of that, and he signed it around the front. So it's a nice thing to have. But I, I hope you've all appreciated uh, our little look at Matt Baker here. Yeah. So you, you know. Are, I'm sorry. No, I am a comic book enthusiast. I've been a fan for 40-some years. And no, I don't work in any of the places, but they all know me. <laughs> they all know me well. I'm well known. A to Z's over in Garden City. Uh, I do some of these at Pieces and Pages, too. Yeah, that's a place over on Middle Belt. Yeah, it's on Middle Belt. It's right near, remember where uh, Long John Silver's used to be on Middle Belt in um, Plymouth? Or on Plymouth Road, rather. Plymouth, yeah. She's on Plymouth. Maybe we should all just take the lesson from this to go home and read a good book something. <laughs> Look at some good art. That's a good book, too. That's, that's an important book. A very important book. Yep, you can't do without it. That's for sure. It's one of the biggies. Well, feel free. That's what I bring them for. Right.